Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin, where we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Yes, my friend, that is what we do. Sometimes the Bible can be a bit confusing, so we bust it down like a fracture. We're asking questions along the way, questions like, hey, what do these Gospels have to do with me? That's what I want to know. How can I take these Gospels? They come to me each and every week and apply them into my daily living so that I can become a reflection of God's love to a world as face that don't know God for sure and definitely is in deep need of more love. Don't you think I may take a look around, my friend? There's a lot of bad news bears out there. How can I take the good news and apply it into my daily living so that I can become, well, a light in this darkness? I want to be a tool in the hand of God, making present His kingdom, not someday, but today and every day, and that's what this show's all about. got to say, it's still sick. Still sick here. Got a sinus condition. My ears are filled with fluid. I can't hear a thing. But we press on. Why? Because that's what we do. And we got a real good message today. Oh, yes. We're going to be talking about the prince of this world. We're going to be talking about the morning star. We're going to be talking about Lucifer. We're going to be talking about how he works and how we can avoid him and how we can combat what his strategies are. But what do you say we just quiet our minds, put ourselves in the presence of God? You know, God wants to speak to you. The question is, are you ready to listen? We're going to school, my friend. The question is, are you ready to be the student? God speaks to us in many ways, but one very powerful way is his word. So what do you say? I quit yipping about it. We get right on into it. We are hearing a classic gospel today. It is from the gospel of Luke. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus returned to the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live on bread alone. Then he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a single instant, And the devil said to him, I shall give to you all this power and glory. For it has been handed over to me, and I may give it to whomever I wish. All of this will be yours if you worship me. Jesus said to him in reply, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Then he led him to Jerusalem, made him stand on the parapet of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and with their hands they will support you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him in reply, It also says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a while. The gospel of the Lord. And what a gospel it is, my friend. There's a whole lot here. So call the kids. It's going to be a good one. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. You stick around. We'll be right back. And we're going to talk about this gospel and a few other things here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. It is such a pleasure to be able to come into your home each and every week and share the good news, but it's a bit expensive. So I would ask you to consider grabbing a piece of paper and a pencil, and at the next break, I'm going to share with you some details how you can become a partner with Daily Living. And together, we can take the good news to a lost world. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. So today, we're dealing with an issue that is as much a part of the human condition as breathing. It's as much a part of life as birth. Of course, I'm talking about temptation. We are all tempted in this life. So let's begin. What exactly is a temptation? In a world 
where there seems to be no longer any absolutes? That's a good question. I imagine if you were to put 100 people in a room, start talking about temptations, you get all kinds of viewpoints. What some might see as a temptation, others might consider a viable choice. Still others would insist it was a right. So what is temptation? Well, from a religious point of view, temptation is the enticement to do something that is against the Creator's will, or put another way, disobey what God has deemed good. And to go not with what He wants, but with what I want. So right away, it's a clash of wills, the world, God's world. We've talked about this. As human beings, we have been given a gift. And we will to do what we will to do. And this gift has many consequences. You know, the other day, I got into my car and I was backing out of the driveway and I put on my blinker and it started going really fast, which I think means that the bulb's going out. I don't know. But whatever reason, the car is not working which was mildly irritating. I mean, not a huge deal, but just one more thing to put on the list. But I wasn't mad at the car itself. I, I, I didn't imagine that somehow the car was sitting in the garage all night waiting on me to come down so he could break and I'll show him. I'll frustrate, I'll frustrate Father C because as complex as a car is, they clearly don't have a will. Now, let's move up the chain of God's creation a bit and talk about my cat, Stormy. She kind of has a will, I guess, sort of. But when she jumps up on the table to swipe off a glass under the floor, is she doing this to irritate me or is this just what cats do? My friend in Nevada says that she has a brain the size of a walnut and is acting largely on instinct. It's cat instinct. She's not sitting around scheming about how she's going to upset me, although I do sometimes wonder. But by the time you get to human beings, it, we're clearly different than cars and cats because we've been given something that separates us from all of God's creation, and that gift is will. And it's a wild stallion, my friend. We can get up in the morning and decide to rob somebody, or we can get up in the morning and decide to be of service to somebody. It is our choice. Car can't do that. Stormy can't do that. But I can do it. I've been given the choice to choose what to do. So when I'm asked that you know, $100,000 question, well, if your God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? It has to do with will. But there's a second issue it has to do with. And that second issue is Satan, also known as Lucifer, or Morning Star, Prince of the World, Father of Lies. Around here, we call him Diablo. Now, you might say, well, Fantasy, I don't believe in the devil. And, and that's fine, because trust me, he believes in you. And if you don't believe in him, he's got you exactly where he wants you. Because think about it. If you have no knowledge of your enemy, you have no defense against your enemy. And as the world turns and civilization advances, we make great strides in, in, in technology and in medicine and science. We have reduced Diablo all the way to a myth. We have painted him red and given him horns with a pitchfork. Many claim Satan is some medieval character dreamed up by old men in purple robes who want to control us. Some collective consciousness of man's failing. Again, if that's you, he's got you right where he wants you. So with that said, let's talk about our gospel. We are hearing from the gospel of Luke, and of course, Let's talk a little bit about Luke. I'd like to preface my comments with just a few comments about Luke. Luke is giving you his, bio, his, bio, his biography of Jesus. And he begins, Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who are eyewitnesses from the beginning of the world and the Word have handed it down to us, I too have decided after investigating everything accurately anew to write it down in an orderly sequence 
to you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize the teachings and the certainty of the teachings that you have received. Now, that's the sentence. Who is this guy, Luke? It might surprise some to know that Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. Tradition has Luke as a doctor or historian. And unlike the Gospel of John, that's much less interested in detail of exactly when and how it happened, Luke's very much interested in that. John wants to know what it means. Luke wants to get it down as clinically and accurately as possible. And to do that, he interviews many people. I'm sure he spoke to the Blessed Mother. I'm sure he spoke to Mary Magdalene. Scripture scholars say that he got most of his information from Peter. But our gospel today is a bit interesting because there are no eyewitnesses. So given the fact that it appears in all three synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay, Jesus must have thought it was pretty important because he clearly shared the details with his disciples. So as you're listening to the story, keep in mind that Jesus is sharing this story with you for a purpose, filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those 40 days, and he was very hungry. Now, like I said, this appears in all three synoptic gospels. It takes place in the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus, immediately following the baptism of Jesus, which again appears in all three synoptic gospels. Slightly different details in Luke's account, which is our gospel today, after Jesus comes out of the water, after being baptized, the Spirit of the Lord descends upon him in the form of a dove. And then the voice comes from heaven, this is my beloved son of whom I'm well pleased. Now, when I think about a dove, I think of peace and love, Woodstock, gentle like the wind. Yet this same dove immediately led Jesus into the desert. So that dove had claws. I, I prefer the Marconian translation of drove Jesus into the desert. The Greek word ekbalo, meaning to throw, almost suggesting violence shoving Jesus into the desert, which begs the question of why, but we're going to get to that. Led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted for 40 days. Now, 40 is a significant number. You see it often in Scripture. And it's not like we think of 40 days. It's like, well, it's a month plus a week plus three days. It's not really a hard set of time. It's more like a protracted period of time, long associated with a period of testing, trial or probation. It rained for 40 days when Noah was on the ark. Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days. Elijah went without food for 40 days on, on Mount Horeb. Jonah warned uh, Nineveh for 40 days, and it goes on and on and on. So our gospel today has Jesus spending this period of time without food, and he's hungry, and he's weak, hungry, Weak in the desert. And that, of course, is the moment that Diablo makes his move because that's what he does. He's an opportunist. He waits until we're weak and hungry in the desert of our own lives, when we're feeling isolated, when we're fearing our future, regretting our past, when we are vulnerable. That's a tough word to say. That's when he comes. Now, I imagine he's been waiting for this opportunity for a long time, ever since the Magi arrived on the scene so long ago, inquiring about the whereabouts of the newborn king. He's been looking to destroy him. And he almost did through Herod and the killing of the babies. But they slipped off to Egypt, and ever since, he's been scouring the earth. But Jesus has been well hidden in the house of a carpenter in the backwoods town of Nazareth. This is Daily Living. I'm Bada Chape, and you stick around. We'll be right back, and we will continue to talk about this amazing gospel that comes to us here as we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living. If you feel like you're being fed by this ministry, I would ask you to prayerfully consider a partnership 
with daily living and what we're trying to do here. A monthly gift of any amount that you feel comfortable with and I will send you a monthly newsletter and if you provide an email address, a script of the show prior to its broadcast. Just write a check to Daily Living, P.O. Box 339, Nitro, West Virginia, 25143. You can also go on the website at mydailyliving.com to give through PayPal, and together we can shine the light of the good news in a whole lot of dark places. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. Now, just for the break, you have Diablo, he's lying on some beach in hell, and he hears, this is my beloved son, of who I am well pleased. <laughs> and that gets his attention. So, you know who shows up. But again, why? Why would the creator of all things allow Satan access to his son? Well, it kind of gets back to that whole question of why there's evil in the world. It's will, my friends, the world, God's world, like us in all things, but sin, which would mean by definition, he would have to be tempted. It's part of the human condition. That Greek word for temptation is parazo. A funny thing about that word parazo, it can mean temptation, but it can also mean test. And let me tell you, there's a big difference. Temptation is a seduction to do evil, going against God's will. Meanwhile, a test is seeking to discover a person's moral qualities or character. So while a temptation is designed to destroy, a test is designed to affirm and build up. So I guess whether it's a temptation or a test really kind of is all up to you. If it leads to your destruction, well, it was a temptation. If you prevail, well, then I guess it was a test. And when you think about it that way, temptation becomes necessary because without it, there can be little claim to virtue. Just as fire tries iron, temptation tries a just man. Satan is the author of temptation, and he has successfully tempted every man since Adam. But now he is facing the new Adam. Now, whether Satan knows that Jesus is the Son of God or not, for sure, I don't know. But one thing, he, he definitely knows that Jesus is a threat. And he knows that he's coming into the world to take over his kingdom or overthrow it. He heard that from the Magi. He's learned that from Scripture. A Messiah is going to come. His kingdom was in jeopardy. And you know that the prince of this world is not going to give it all away to the prince of peace without a fight. He had successfully tempted the first Adam to break from the will of God. And now he's coming to do the same. I imagine he's probably probably pretty confident he's going to succeed because after all these human beings that God has created are so easily tempted. Let us never be surprised my friend when we are tempted by the devil. That's what he does. We should expect it as a matter of course and let us never forget that Jesus was in fact tempted and what comes out of that temptation is his ability to empathize with us as we are tempted. Like us in all things but sin. It is fitting that Jesus would begin his ministry taking on Satan's greatest tool, which is strong temptation. So let's take a closer look at these temptations, because when we, when we look at them, we see the cunning of a master who knows exactly where to go. He is well acquainted with every weakness of the human condition. If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. So, Jesus is hungry, and this is the first place Diablo goes. Hey, God has abandoned you. He won't satisfy you, so why don't you satisfy yourself? He is trying to persuade Jesus to distrust the Father's providential care. I see him leaning in with a smirk on his face saying, How's God's will working out for you now, son? He's appealing to the fear that his needs will not be met. Jesus responds, it is written, one does not live on bread alone. Now that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, and it isn't in our gospel today, but it says in Deuteronomy, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth 
of God. In other words, trusting in God's provision. That's where he starts. Trusting in God's will. Then he took them up and showed them all the kingdoms of the world in a single instant. Now, first of all, notice there's a bit of a discrepancy between the Lucan and the Matthean accounts because the order is slightly different. But anyway, the devil says to Jesus, I shall give you all of this power and glory for it's been handed over to me and I may give it to whomever I wish. All of this is yours if you worship me. So I have a question. I will give you all of this power and glory for it has all been handed over to me. How did he get it? Did God give Satan this world? No. It kind of goes back to our question of how there's so much evil in the world. Once again, it's will. God created this world and he gave it to Adam and Eve and through them us. But he also gave them free will. And Satan has manipulated it from us ever since as we have freely given it to him through our choices and rebellion. Satan is offering it all back to Jesus, and he doesn't have to suffer. He doesn't have to mess with the Romans. He doesn't have to die. He is appealing to his frustration that this is what's going to happen as he faces Calvary. We see this raise itself in the garden when Jesus says, if it is your will, may this cup pass, but not will not my will, but thy will be done. But, I mean, he's asking for it to pass. All he's got to do right here is make a deal with the devil and he can be a Messiah without suffering. We live in a world that makes a deal with the devil every day. We call it for the greater good. Thank God Jesus didn't take the bait. Then he led him to Jerusalem and made him stand on the parapet of the temple. And said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And with their hands, they will support you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. I love that. Dash your foot against a stone. So first of all, he led him to the Jerusalem and made him stand on the parapet of the temple. I mean, let me just mention in passing that if Satan has the power to lead Jesus anywhere and make him do anything, how much more does he have the power to take you places and make you do whatever he wants? I'm just saying. Now, it seems that Satan is playing a bit of Bible trivia here. Of course, he knows the Bible well, certainly better than you and I know it, but he's met his match today. Because what Satan doesn't understand is that he's in the presence of the Word made flesh dwelling among us. The Logos that has been with us ever since the Spirit of the Lord moved across the deep in Genesis. He is appealing to the fantasy of Jesus putting Satan in his place. I can just see Jesus go, oh, I'll show you. But what does Jesus say? Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So these three temptations really represent all temptation. Stones to bread represent unbelief. God's provision isn't enough. He can't be trusted. Lack of faith. The second, all this can be yours if you worship me, represents worldliness, materialism, lust of the eyes. The idea that somehow we can create our own kingdom outside of God's will. All we got to do is make a deal with the devil. That third temptation, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, throw yourself off this temple. That is an appeal to the ego, representing egoism. If I'm the son of God, well, I'll show you. Now, could Jesus have thrown himself off that temple and survived it? Yeah, I'm thinking the presumption would, yes, of course. But is that God's will? No. It's never God's will for us to assert our power and prove anything. So what do we learn? What's the deeper meaning? How can we apply this into our daily living? Notice how Jesus answers all three temptations the same way. It is written. When you are tempted by the author of temptation, you need a sword, my friend. And that sword is the word. Now, this isn't in Scripture, but my own imagination. 
I imagine after all this was over, Jesus walked out of one side of the desert into a small fishing town called Capernaum. Meanwhile, the devil walked out the other side of the desert and called a meeting. And in that meeting, he announced, I have met a man today that I cannot defeat. He has the logos, the sword of the Lord coming from his mouth. He cannot be tempted, and I've tempted them all. We need to change our strategy. Number one, we need to convince this world that I do not exist. Let them make me a cartoon character, some relic from the past. Let them paint me red and give me a tail with horns. Meanwhile, we need to go undercover. Number two, we need to convince this world that the Holy Spirit does not exist. Let them wave their hands and swoon and worship as they choose, but keep them away from a conscious contact with his Holy Spirit. Number three, we need to kill that man. Of course, we can't kill him, but we can manipulate others to kill him for us, and that's exactly what he did, and that's exactly what he continues to do today. Once the devil was walking along with one of his cohorts, he saw a man ahead pick up something shiny from the ground. What did he find? asked the cohort. A piece of the truth, the devil replied. Doesn't it bother you that he found a piece of the truth? asked the cohort. No, said the devil. I will see to it that he makes a religion out of it. You know, every day in this country, somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. Hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life. And I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.